subject today is uh, Behold My Servant. And uh, the uh, phrase comes from the Old Testament where the prophecy is of the coming of Jesus. It's a messianic prophecy and uh, several times in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah. Now, um, the point of the message today is we want to see something about Jesus. We need to see more and more about Jesus. He, he is exhaustless. He is perfect, beautiful. And as we read the Gospels, which the Bible commands us to do, it says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. So the Bible itself, in the New Testament, the Word of God encourages us to always stay close to the words of Jesus. Now, we, there's a lot of Bible there, a lot of other words, but the words of Christ. Why? Because when you read the words of Jesus and the words about Jesus, you get a picture of him. And the Bible says that that picture of Christ that we get in our minds and hearts, whatever that picture is made up of in our minds and how, what he looks like, what we think he's like, the, that affects us. And it makes us like him. That is the process that God has designed for us. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That's God's word. So as we know more of Jesus, he is the vision of God himself incarnate in the flesh so we can see him and know him and become like him, which is the best thing for us. The absolute best thing is to become like Jesus. Nothing else compares to it. There's all kinds of good things in life, some bad things, but to become like Christ, and that's a treasure. It's a, like a hidden treasure because the world has no clue. Christians should read the word and see where it says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and it's just a one phrase, and it's a beautiful phrase, and I want to use it as a setting for the message today. And it is, Paul says this, Paul says, now I, Paul, Paul's writing this to the Corinthians. He says, I, Paul, beseech you, I beg you, I beg of you, what? By the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That, that struck me. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. The reason it strikes me is because I have a problem with meekness and gentleness. <laughs> and uh, most of us do at times, some more, some less. But some of us have a little problem with meekness, not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is, is a, 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 a true self-evaluation of what you really are and what you're capable of, not exaggerated, not wishful thinking, but what you really are. The meekness is an awareness, and, and it, it leads to a humility, a genuine humility, which leads Christians to a deeper trust in the Lord, their need of God's spirit and his power and his presence. That awareness is the source of strength for us. So he says, by the meekness, and then Paul goes on to say, who in presence I am base among you, being absent, I'm bold. And then he proceeds to be bold in his writing because they needed a message uh, of correction. And, uh, but he prefaces his, his, his approach to them about the problems that he's dealing with. The Corinthians had all kinds of problems, and he's getting ready to address some, some problems. 
But he says, first of all, he lays a foundation for how you approach someone, something, anything in, in your life. The Christian needs to be guided by the example of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now, when we read the Gospels, very easy to miss that. Uh, you hear people say, oh, the meek and mild Jesus. Well, that's true. He was meek and mild. There were times when he cleansed the temple, he wasn't very mild, <laughs> and he was acting as the prophet, the Old Testament prophet, fulfilling that role, which is part of his ministry, and he cleansed the temple and so forth. But even then, it, it, it makes it clear that, that he was in perfect control. He, he dumped the tables over. He knew exactly what he was doing. He preached to the people. He said, you've made this house of God just to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And, and he released the doves very gently. He released the doves. So he was in perfect control. And that was a one-time deal when he did that. Maybe he did it twice, but whether he did it once or twice, it was unique in his life because the rest of the time he was so gentle. And that's one of the things I'd like us to see today in, in the message of how Jesus dealt with his disciples when they were so, uh, so um, uh, self-centered, definitely self-centered, uh, ambitious, um, misguided, oh, no question. When you read the Gospels and you study the reactions, the words of the disciples toward Christ throughout the Gospels, you see that. And that's a study in itself. So we'll begin where it says in... Um, Okay, let's look at this. I'm sorry. Here we go. Okay, it says in chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel, uh, 8.31, parallel passage in Matthew 16.21, and another like passage, another passage, uh, 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 presentation of this particular event in Luke chapter 9. So three of the gospel writers tell us this, and I'm going to read Mark's uh, particular uh, description. Mark 8.31, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests. Key word there, he began, this is brand new. He, he has not mentioned anything up to this point to his disciples that he was gonna be put to death. Uh, up until now, they looked at him as the savior, the Messiah who'd come to take over and rule and reign and set up the kingdom of God through Israel. That was their notion and their vision of, of the coming of the Messiah. And they were following Jesus and they didn't see this part of it. Why? Because he hadn't told them yet. So here it says he began, he first began to teach them. In Matthew it says, from that time began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. That, that had to be a shock. It was such a shock that they didn't accept it. They didn't, they didn't get it. They just didn't believe it. 
Luke, Luke puts it this way, the son of man, he, he says, he says, but he, he, he charged them uh, that they told, not to tell where they were and what was going on. And then he says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, the chief priests, and be killed and the third day raised up. They didn't get it. And he says, Peter then, uh, when he heard this, and it says, he said he was going to rise again. And he spake the saying openly, and Peter took him aside when he said this. Peter heard what he said, and he understood what he said, that he was going to die. He, it was very real to Peter. It was not like some symbolic thing or something. And, and so Peter takes him, Mark tells us, verse 32, and began to rebuke him. <laughs> okay, Peter's going to straighten Jesus out. He's rebuking him. That means he's kind of getting on him. Like, you know, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's what a rebuke is. When you say a rebuke, when you rebuke somebody, usually you're telling them there's something wrong with you. You're saying something wrong. You're thinking wrong. You're doing wrong. You're getting ready to do wrong. So he rebukes him. But he turning about and seeing his disciples rebuked Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, he wasn't literally calling Peter Satan, but he's just, that's a way of saying something about this, this is something to be rejected. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou mindest you don't understand the things of God. You don't know what's going on, Peter. You don't get it. You don't see, you don't have the full picture. And he says, but you are thinking in terms of men, which is always save your life, never lose your life. Uh, don't even think about dying or being killed. And then he continues and says, he called unto him the multitude. So he didn't, now he had the disciples around him, his, his 12 disciples, but he called all the rest of his people that were there listening. He said, come here, listen, listen to this. And, and, and it takes this occasion to te give a teaching. And he says, and said unto them, if anyone would come after me. If you're going to follow me, obey me, serve me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. And, and daily, Luke says, Luke says daily, take up his cross daily, every day. And uh, for whosoever would save his life will lose it and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake or for the gospels shall save it. What's it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? So he takes this occasion to teach them something. Now he didn't get mad at Peter. He didn't, he didn't rebuke Peter back. He just said, now listen, here's the truth about this matter. And he, and he corrects them and directs them. And then, now later on, we're going to see that three different times the Lord Jesus specifically pointed out that he was going to be put to death. At least three. There may have been others, but three are recorded. So in Mark chapter 9, we have the story of the man who brought his son to Jesus, who was totally ravaged mentally, and he was thrown into fits and, 
and seizures and so forth. It was like he was going to die, and this demon just beat him up terribly, and he brought his son to Jesus' disciples, and expecting them to be able to heal him because Jesus had given them power to heal. And they couldn't heal him. They could, he couldn't do anything with him. So he comes to Jesus and says, I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't heal him. So Jesus said, okay, bring him here. And he uh, addressed the situation and healed the boy and uh, set him free. And the disciples, of course, wondered why they couldn't do it. He said, because of your lack of faith. You didn't really believe he scared you. You didn't believe you could do it. And uh, I, even though I'd given you the power to do it, you couldn't do it. Very common. So anyway, once that happened, it says, they went from there through Galilee, and he would not have any man know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is delivered up into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. Number two, he's again. Now this is a different time, different place. They're going through Galilee, and he, and he says, look, I can't handle the crowds as it is. Just don't go around talking about all these miracles and stuff. Let's just be quiet about it. Uh, don't even tell people I'm here. He wanted, it, was, it was a matter of practicality, of being able to teach. He wanted to teach, and the people were overwhelming him. So he says, just, you know, be quiet about it. But one of the main points he's making is, listen, remember, I, I have to remind you, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men. They shall kill him. And when he's killed after three days, he will rise again. And then here's the response of the disciples. They understood not the saying. Well, it seems like plain English or plain Aramaic or Greek, whatever he spoke to them in, it's clear enough they didn't get it. They couldn't get it. What? And they were afraid to ask him. Why were they afraid to ask him? It says they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Even And then they were sorry. They were very sorry. And, and, and so now they, they get where they're going. And uh, in Mark chapter 9, verse 33, it says they came to Capernaum. That's where they were headed, in Galilee. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about along the way? So he's walking probably ahead of them. They're behind him, following him. And they're back there arguing. So Jesus says, what were, you, what were you guys arguing about along the way? It says, but they held their peace. <laughs> Nobody would answer. How come? Because they argued which of them should be the greatest. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Which of them shall be the greatest? So he sat down called to 12, he said to them, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you're going to minister, you've got to minister. And like a little child, you humble yourself. And uh, he, he goes on to explain to them, and it says, uh, they, they, they were arguing over who should be the greatest, who should be the greatest. Now, again, they're going along in Mark chapter 10, and they're on their way up to Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had already been threatened 
He'd warned the disciples at least twice that when they went to Jerusalem, he was going to be put to death. So they were upset. They didn't understand. They didn't really know how that could be real. But they, they, were, they were very upset. And it says they were like confused and puzzled and amazed. They just couldn't compute. Uh, here's a man who raised the dead. And he says they're going to kill him. Here's a man who comes fulfilling all the predictions of the coming king, the Messiah, the savior of Israel and the world. And he's talking about being killed. It just didn't compute. And he took again the 12 and began to tell them the things that were to happen to him, saying, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be delivered into the chief priests, the scribes. They shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, to the Romans, and they will mock him, spit upon him, scourge him, kill him, and after three days he will rise again. Now here's the mind blower to me. He just gets finished saying these words and his mother and, and, and uh, not his, his mother, uh, the mother of, uh, of, uh, of uh, James and John, James and John the disciples comes to him and said, we, have, we want to ask you for a favor. He just got done saying what he was going to say. We want to ask you for a favor. So Jesus said, okay, what, what is it you want? And so they come to him and they say, um, we, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. They put it that way. That we really want you to do this. And, and, and so they, they, um, uh, they, they come to him and, and he says to them, um, excuse me, get this right. He says, he says, they said, grant us, grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand in your glory. Now he just got done saying, I'm going to be put to death. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be this, 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 and this. And they said, wait, 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 we want to ask you <laughs> for a favor. And so Jesus, how did, here's the, the thing that I love, the way Jesus responded in these situations. I mean, if it was me, I'd have freaked out. <laughs> I said, what are, you, are you listening? Do you hear what I'm saying? All you can think about is yourselves. No, none of that. He didn't even think like that. He says to them, uh, Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. You, you don't realize what you're asking. Are, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Talking about all this that he's going to go through and suffer on the cross and the death on the cross and all that he's going to go through, the horror of it all and eternal death for mankind. He says, can you drink that cup? They don't, they don't even know what the cup is. And, 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 and he says, can you be baptized with a baptism which was a baptism of pain and trouble. It's a way of putting it. And, and, and he said, they say to him, yes, we can do it. <laughs> yes, remember the hymn, uh, are ye able, said the master, to be crucified with me? Yay, the sturdy dreamers answered, uh, we can do it. You know, uh, that hymn is not in our hymnal, I'm sorry to say, but, and, and baptized with, they said unto him, we're able. Jesus said unto him, you're, you're going to taste the cup, okay. You will taste the cup. 
He said, but, but it's not for me to give who sits on my right hand and my left, but for those by whom God has prepared it. And then the rest of the 10, after the two and their mother came, the rest of the 10 got very angry and there was a, all kinds of anger and indignation uh, against James and John. So then Jesus calls them together and he says, you know, when a man is elected or he's given a place of authority and power, he has great power and he uses that power. He says, but, but that's the way the Gentiles rule. He said, great authority, but it is not so among you. Now they're thinking of ruling and reigning and you know, some high place. He says, whosoever would become great among you, and that's what they're wanting to be great. He says, you, he shall be your minister and whosoever would be first among you should be your slave of all. For verily the Son of Man came not to be, to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. What's the point? The point is to see how Jesus responded so beautifully, so gently, so lovingly, so patiently with these disciples who were enough to drive him to distraction. The, the, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the exact likeness of the eternal God, emptied himself, humbled himself, and became like a slave. Paul says, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So the message today that I wanted to get across was all of us need to be more gentle with ourselves, with each other, with others around us, especially those who can so easily irritate us and life today is full of irritations. It usually comes in the form of other individuals. We need that gentleness and meekness of Christ. So why? Because we know God's got it under control. He's in control. In the worst possible scenario, Jesus facing the cross and all that went with the cross and he could remain calm and gentle with his disciples who just didn't get it, totally missed it until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and then they understood and then they looked back, I'm sure, with shame on themselves for the way they rebuked Jesus and tested him and bugged him and bothered him when he was just doing the most beautiful thing he could do serving, healing, delivering, encouraging, and strengthening. With the sound of a strange, cymbals and heart, we praise you.